All right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, I'm doing spring cleaning today, and I've really enjoyed doing spring cleaning with you. I This thought crossed my mind about three times this morning that I was going to forget to come, you know, that I was going to get involved in my spring cleaning and forget to come and teach. And so I thought, well, if I just leave Zoom on all day, I won't forget to come because I'll hear when it's my turn. <laughs> So that's what I did. I just love Zoom on all day, stayed in the sanctuary all day. And of course, as I heard Doreen, you know, starting to, to get to the end, I thought, well, time for me to take a break and 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 come into the sanctuary and teach. So um, so that was a good plan. But it was also really fun um, spring cleaning with you. all I like that very, very much. A lot better than doing it by myself. So we are here for seven steps to awakening and out of the stillness. And we're gonna be starting on number 282. And I will start with um, the seven steps to awakening. I believe we're looking at Nizargadatta Maharaj. Your mistake lies in your belief that you are born. You were never born nor will you ever die. But you believe that you were born at a certain date and place and that a particular body is your own. So what we're going to look at, um, I remember right where I was when, when I was contemplating this. I was in Seattle staying at somebody's house. I was, a, I was, the, I was leading a gathering at their house that weekend. And uh, this was, for me, the very beginning of starting to contemplate, uh, starting to question uh, whether I was born and whether I would die. So this is like my very first attempt at contemplating something like that. So let me share with you from my journal, number 282. Do I know for a fact that I was born or is that an assumption? My mother told me I was born. She says she knows because she was there. <laughs> However, does she really know that this birth was my beginning or does she only believe birth was my beginning? Is the idea that I was born a fact or an assumption? And I'll stop there. I'll, I'll go on after we look at this. Um, you know, we can look at the abortion controversy uh, as we're considering this, because um, as we know, uh, some people say that life begins at conception. Uh, some people say that life begins at birth. Therefore, we have a controversy, right? But listen to those words again very carefully. Some people say life begins at conception. Some people say life begins at birth. If there can be a difference of opinion there, can either one actually be the truth? No, that can't be. That's, that's you know, if, if the abortion controversy gives us any gift at all, the gift it gives us is that uh, we make assumptions. We have beliefs, beliefs about when life begins. We don't have a fact, right? That's pretty friggin' amazing if you think about it. You know, we have assumptions, we have beliefs, we don't have a fact, or else we couldn't argue about it. We can argue about it because it's merely belief. It's merely assumption, right? And I, and I know that I have gone through the contemplation with you all before in this program where, you know, we contemplate the fact that even before conception, there was life in both the sperm and the egg right? Like life didn't actually begin at conception. 
life was prior to conception, right? And, and uh, you know, if we trace either the, the sperm or the egg back, well, where did they come from? You know, uh, you know, well, they're, they're a collection of cells. So even prior to the sperm or prior to the egg, there was life. I mean, you can, it doesn't matter how far you go back, how far you trace this back, even if you trace it back like Nizargadatta did, he, he did this as well. And he traced it back to even the food that was eaten, that nourished the cells, that created the sperm, right? There was life in the food. There was life in the vegetables. So no matter how far you trace this back, you can't actually find the beginning of life. It's friggin' amazing. So whether we pick conception or whether we pick when it's a viable fetus or whether we pick when it's born and we, and, and we say that's when life began, we're making it up. <laughs> it's a lie. And we're making it up. We're, we're forming a belief. And now we're arguing with other people about it, right? <laughs> It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So what was really helpful to me in this particular inquiry, and, and, and again, and this is the very first time, or right, there might have been another, another time in this time frame, but this time frame was the very first time I began to seriously question, was I born and, and will I die? What was really key to me in getting to an aha in this particular paragraph was the word assumption. You know, I saw that it was an assumption that my life began at birth. My mother took on that assumption and then she passed that assumption on to me, right? You were born in Coffeyville, Kansas at 5.22 p.m., you know, in, in, in this particular hospital, right? And I took that on as that was my beginning. And of course, we all did that, right? That was my beginning. So... Do I know for a fact? Another key word here is fact. You get to really look at the word fact. What does that mean? And the word assumption. What does that mean? And, and really ask, is it a fact that my life began then? Or was that an assumption? Do I know for a fact that I was born? Or is that an assumption? My mother told me I was born. In fact, every time I read this, I hear her getting angry. Regina, of course you were born. <laughs> I can just hear that in my background when I read this. <laughs> my mother told me I was born. She says she knows because she was there. However, does she really know that this birth was my beginning? Or does she only believe birth was my beginning? Is the idea that I was born a fact or an assumption? And I think we can all agree it was an, it's an assumption, right? It's just an assumption. Okay, so let's go to the next paragraph. We see a lifeless body and we say there is death. But is death a fact or an assumption? Have I ever had a direct experience of death or is life being my only direct experience. Isn't the idea of death based on an outside perception? Isn't the one seeing this perception and interpreting it as death, current life, being? So let's just take um, roadkill as an example, right? You see a, an animal on the side of the road that has been hit by a car and that is dead. So just go ahead. I mean, we've all seen roadkill. Is that true for everyone? Do we have a shared experience there? <laughs> okay, so just remember a time when you saw a dead animal on the side of the road, or if you can't specifically remember, just make it up. It'll come from your memory. And you know, look at that critter laying there dead. And look at your direct experience in that moment. Do you have a direct experience of life or death? Life, right? I saw Sina say it. Life. Do you actually know death? Or do you only know 
life. Right? I only know life. I, you know, I see a dead body and I make an assumption death. I'm sure somewhere along the way, although I don't remember, I'm sure I was taught death, right? We were all taught death, but do we know for a fact from direct experience that there actually is even such a thing as death? Or is that an assumption? If you really look at it, I mean, I know some of us have lost loved ones and, and we know those loved ones are no longer here and we can acknowledge that, but do you have any idea whether there really is such a thing as death? Or for that matter, you know, a lot of us imagine some type of an afterlife experience. Do you even know that? Do you know anything other than your current life experience, other than is right other than life that's all you actually know see we have we have no idea how much we make up stuff or learned it and believe it and call it call it fact when in actuality we have never verified it not only that if you really look you can't verify it it's unverifiable it's unverifiable there's only one way to find out if there's such a thing as death and that's to die. And if there is such a thing as death, you still won't be able to verify it because you'll be dead. <laughs> so death is completely unverifiable. I remember I was watching a movie once and in the beginning of the movie, there's this car accident and one of the characters dies, but in the movie, you know, the person leaves their body and they're hovering above and they watch they watch them pull their dead body out of the vehicle and, and the character goes, oh my gosh, I'm dead. And it hit me. If you can say, oh my gosh, I'm dead. Are you dead? No. So if something like that happens, we still can't verify death. And if there is an actual thing as death, we won't be able to verify it because we're dead. You know what I mean? Like death is completely unverifiable. It's merely a belief. Isn't that amazing? You will never be able to verify death. Either you don't die or you do, but you'll never be able to verify it. It's a belief. And I told you all last time I was here about when my dog, Jamie, died, how I took that walk afterwards and I noticed that there was nothing missing from life. Like life hadn't changed one iota. You know, I told you, you couldn't like cut a little piece out of life and say, that's where Jamie was, right? I mean, life was just as full, just as alive as it always had been. The only thing I could verify was life. So let me read this to you again. We see a lifeless body and we say there is death. But is death a fact or an assumption? Have I ever had a direct experience of death? Or is life being my only direct experience? Isn't the idea of death based on outside perception? Isn't the one seeing this perception and interpreting it as death, current life being, right? Only, only life, you know, some, someone who is alive, only life can say that is death, right? It's amazing. So life is all we actually know. If I look only from my actual direct experience, not based on what I learned or interpreted, do I know anything other than always hear life being? Do I know from my direct experience life beginning? Do I know from my direct experience life ending? Or are life beginning and life ending, ideas learned, interpreted, and assumed. 
Can anybody remember beginning? No. So how do we know it happened? It's just what we were told. That's that's the answer to the question, guys. <laughs> it's just what we were told. It's not life beginning is not verifiable either. Just like you cannot verify death as a direct experience, you cannot verify life beginning as a direct experience. We have been told, we have believed, certainly people believe like hell. Like your mom will say, I know you were born, I was there. You know, the doctor would say, I know you were born, I delivered you, right? But nobody, nobody, nobody has a direct experience of remembering that beginning. Nobody can verify that that's a truth. So why do we believe those assumptions? Why don't we you know, put our attention on another assumption and say that's also plausible that I never was born? Now, of course, we're not talking about the body, you understand, right? We know the body had a, had a beginning. But I, life, is it possible, is it at least plausible that I existed prior to the body? Is it plausible? Do you have proof that it's not true? Can you disprove that theory? So why are we so attached to believing we were born and that we're going to die when really we have no proof of that? This is the advantage of, of inquiry. Inquiry doesn't always give answers, which is interesting. What it does is it dispels falsehoods. It opens us, right? You don't always get an answer. Like th this inquiry did not bring me to definitely, definitely uh, I existed before the body or definitely, definitely uh, I will never die. It brought me to well, actually, birth is just a belief, you know, that that's when I began is just a belief. The idea that when this body ends, I end, that's just a belief. I cannot prove those things. Therefore, other, you know, the, the other is possible too, right? It, bring, it opens you up is what it does. It seems to me like I remember something, you know how memory is, it's faulty. So I, 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 what I could be saying might not be true. <laughs> but it seems to me that I remember either me or someone else asking Jan Frazier, she stayed at my house for a couple of days. So we were sitting around having conversations and it seems to me that somebody asked her something about, uh, did she know she wasn't going to die? A question like that. And she looked right at us. This is what I remember. She looked right at us and she said, I don't even think about death. It's just an idea. She'd say, no, I, I know I'm eternal or anything like that. She just answered, I'm going to call it truthfully. I don't even think about it. It's just an idea. Think about how truthful that is. Every one of us can say that right now. We don't have to be super duper enlightened. We just have to realize the difference between what's true and what we make up and believe. And we've all just seen that it's true. We cannot verify that we were born, that we had a beginning to life. And we cannot verify that we or anyone or anything else actually dies, that there's such a thing as death. So the true answer is what I remember Jan Frazier gave, giving. I don't even think about it. It's just an idea. So let me just read these three paragraphs again. Do I know for a fact that I was born or is that an assumption? My mother told me I was born. 
She says she knows because she was there. However, does she really know that this birth was my beginning? Or does she only believe birth was my beginning? Is the idea that I was born a fact or an assumption? We see a lifeless body and we say there is death. But is death a fact or an assumption? Have I ever had a direct experience of death? Or is life being my only direct experience? Isn't the idea of death based on outside perception? Isn't the one seeing this perception and interpreting it as death, current life being? If I look only from my actual direct experience, not based on what I learned or interpreted, do I know anything other than always here, life, being? Do I know from my direct experience, life beginning? Do I know from my direct experience, life ending? Or are life beginning and life ending ideas learned, interpreted, and assumed? A few days ago, I got it in my mind that I was going to write down exactly what I am. No bullshit. Just exactly what I am. I'm going to write it down on paper. <laughs> And so I, I sat there and I looked and I, you know, I asked the typical inquiry question, but with this intention of just, I'm going to write down exactly what I am. I asked that typical question. Okay. So who am I or what am I? And I looked and the very first thing that came was here, not in, in a place, you know, just present here. I could verify that, you know, even no matter where this body is, whether this body is in La Vida or Pueblo West or my dad's house or someone else, there's always this sense of here. Somehow here is what I am. It's not where I am. It's what I am. Right. So I wrote here down. And then I asked again, OK, so what am I? What is completely verifiable? What am I? Now. I was able to write that down. I was able to completely verify that. I am now. Um, I couldn't get any further than that. I mean, I think I wrote is, but even is felt like a more of a concept than the here and the now. The here and the now were the two things that felt real, true, you know, like Is was an idea. I don't know how to say that. It just felt like an idea by comparison. Even though it's true, I is, but here and now felt so authentic. You know, how many people, when you ask them, you know, if you were to ask them, what are you, would say here or now. But yet, can't every one of you verify that right now? Isn't that what you are? Aren't you here? Not here in a place, just here. Even if we could somehow take the place away, get this great big giant eraser and erase all the scenery. There's nothing now but a great big giant void. Has the here-ness left? No, because I am here. Here is what I am. It's not where I am, it's what I am. Same thing with now. Now is what I am. That's friggin' amazing too, isn't it? <laughs> That's just amazing. That is exactly what I am. Everything else is a concept. I couldn't find anything else that I didn't feel like was conceptual. Those are the only two things that were not conceptual. I decided to write down exactly what I am. Here and now, that's it. End of story. And it's always true. No matter when I look. Now we can call that life, but see that's even, can you feel how that's another layer? 
on top of the actual direct experience? It's like a conceptual, I mean, it's a good conceptual layer, but it's still a conceptual layer. I mean, what the heck is life uh, here and now? <laughs> I mean, what is life? It's that experience of here and now. It's just a, a name we put on that experience of here and now. And if you can remember back to when you were four or five, or some people maybe can even remember three, wasn't that here and now large then? I mean, that was, it was even, uh, Stein is not so sure it was large. I'm sure that it was large. I mean, I wouldn't have worded it that way. That's a true statement. I wouldn't have worded it that way. But I remember as a child, like I remember everything I remember as a child, a young, young child is when I got in trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I don't have any pleasant memories from early childhood. Every one of them. Well, I remember getting in trouble. I remember my brother getting hurt. I remember uh, our dog dying. You know, like it's all those kind of memories. All before five are are all kind of even age five. Everything I remember is negative. Um, I think my positive memories where they begin to stick are closer to maybe seven, to be honest. I think six and younger. It's all the negative stuff that I remember. But I remember this one time when I was probably about four, you know, we lived in a single story house and we were actually renting that house. The landlord next door had two story house. So the fact that she was our landlord and the fact that it was two story made this little girl think she must have been rich. Now I realize I have no idea if she was rich. I'm a landlord. I live in a two story house. I'm not rich. <laughs> But back then, <laughs> back then, I thought, I thought, you know, that meant she was rich. And so I always wanted to go into her house. And one day she was gone. And I don't remember this part. Somehow I discovered that her back door was unlocked. And I went inside just to be inside that house. And uh, I remember I was set, just sitting at the top of the stairs when, uh, when I got caught, when I, I got found out. But what I remember about that experience is see if I can describe it in words. What I remember about that experience is the innocence of just being here now. I mean, you know, I was just sitting there at the top of the stairs, admittedly being in that house because I thought it was special, but still it was the, I just, it was just the innocence of being here now. Another time I got in trouble, you know, there was this, like, I, I was allowed to go in front of our house, maybe one house down, but I certainly was not allowed at age four to go walking around the block by myself. <laughs> and my mom had these red high heels that I loved. And I put on these red high heels, which are way too big for my foot. And I start walking around the block, pretend I'm an adult. And what I didn't know is she could hear the click, 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 click. <laughs> almost all the way around the block on the brick sidewalks. So when I got back, I got in trouble. But again, I remember the innocence of me just enjoying that click, 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 click going around the block, right? I remember the here now. Like I wasn't thinking, even though I knew I shouldn't have done it, I wasn't thinking, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I wasn't thinking, what's mom going to think when I get home? I wasn't thinking, I was just click, 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 you know? Heels against the red brick sidewalk, right? That's all that was there. You know, so what I can verify even from my memory is that what's the only thing again that I know is here now. It's, 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 it's what I am. I'm not a four-year-old. Hell, I'm almost 63. But as a four-year-old, I was here now. And as 62, I am still here now. And we all know it doesn't age, right? Here now doesn't age. It's just, it's amazing. And why do we get so caught up in thinking that we're something else? A failure. I was listening to Anne, a failure. You know, her mind was trying to tell her she was a failure. Can here now fail? 
How could it? Another word we put on it is being, you know, but that again, it's adding a layer of concept. The reason I say life is a layer of concept and being is a layer of concept is we could get into a debate with somebody. Again, what is being? You know, what is life, right? I mean, then you're starting to get into the concept. But if you look right at this experience of here now, now granted, not everybody knows how to do that. I, I will admit that. But if you can look right at this experience of here now, is there anything here to debate? Can I convince you that you are not here? Or that you are not now? Not if you're looking at your experience, I can't. And if you're looking purely concept, you might say, well, Regina, you're in Colorado. I'm not in Colorado. But see, that was concept. You weren't looking at direct experience, right? You got to look, am I here? Here, yes. Clearly, here. Am I now? Yes, clearly, now. In my life, maybe, you know, <laughs> depends what's life. You know? <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. That's a lot of a lot of talk about nothing again. Fun talk, though. 283. 283. It is in the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. It is in the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. Uh, it's funny because I've actually been looking at the word desire a little differently lately. And um, I'll tell you why. It's because of having translated the Tao Te Ching. Um, you know, it's interesting when you translate something, you really look at words in a different way. It's my first time ever translating things. So it's the first time I ever had that experience of really looking at words with that eye, the eye of a translator. But, you know, chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'm going to start, you know, with the second paragraph. It says, the nameless is the origin of the universe. And then it says, the named is the source of myriad things. And then it says, therefore, remain free of desire to behold wonder. What I realized as I translated this is the named and desire are synonymous. The named and desire are synonymous. The named is thought. Uh, any thought. I mean, you know, let's let's the, the thing that I contemplated, so we'll go with that. The thing that I contemplated uh, first was the word God. God is named. And how do we know that God is named? Well, because people can argue about it, right? People have wars over it, right? People commit terrorist acts over it, right? God is definitely named. So just now we've all had some concept of God, even if it was, there's no such thing. Do you all agree? You've all had thoughts about God in your lifetime. Is this a shared experience? Okay, so it's something we can look at then. <laughs> so I don't care what your thoughts are about God. I want you to look at that thought for a moment. And can you find in that thought a desire of any type, even if it's just the desire to be right about your thoughts about God. Maybe it's a desire to be saved. Maybe it's a desire for something else. But if you look at thought, there's always desire in it. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you cannot separate thought and desire. So I used to think of desire in, in more of a, you know, like I want, you know, I want to go hiking after this, right? I didn't really look at desire in the way that I did until I saw that all names have something to do with the desire. Um, 
Let me see if I can think of another example besides God. God is such a good example. Well, just think the concept food for a moment. Just think the word food. Can you find any desire as soon as you think the word food? It's right there, isn't it? Like they're, they're, they're tied together. Think, think the word day, just the word day. Can you see any desire in the word day at all? Uh, you can. I see you guys shaking your head like you've never looked at these things, but these are very benign words. Food, day. Somehow in the naming of things, it's like what we want it to be is there. Just in the fact that we named things, what we want it to be, what we want it to be is there. Not necessarily at an individual level, uh, more at a subconscious level maybe. Now let's look at what Nizargadatta is saying in 283. It is the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. Even giving things a name is somehow saying, that's what I want it to be. It is the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. And, you know, there's something else in the Tao Te Ching that talks about how, you know, man needs to know when to stop naming things. I mean, if you had never learned the word tree, you could not dismiss a tree as just a tree. You couldn't. Because somehow in, in deciding it's a tree, you've, you've made all these decisions that you know what it is. And you, you, know, you really don't, although some people do care a lot about trees, you really don't need to consider it ever again because you know what it is. But if you never learned the word tree, this is one reason that we sometimes love vacations, love especially traveling to foreign lands. Because whenever we travel to a foreign land and the more foreign, the better, meaning the more different from your own culture. Whenever we travel to a foreign land, we encounter things we have not yet labeled. And when we encounter these things we have not yet labeled, we look at them with openness and awe. Right. And that's the experience of, you know, what we call travel. That's the experience of travel. It's really not knowing. And in our everyday life, the reason we feel like we need to get away, or so many of us do, like we need to get away from our everyday life is we've labeled everything in this room. We know what everything is. There's nothing here to feel awe about. In fact, we've labeled a heck of a lot of it as problems, responsibilities. There's nothing here to feel awe about. I have to go somewhere else to feel awe. But it's not true. We just have to open up beyond the way we've labeled things. We just have to open up beyond what we've put on everything and allow it to be fresh and new. In fact, allow it to be here and now just as I am and nothing else. Allow it to be nothing else. You know, like right now my mouth is a little dry because I'm talking and I'm in Colorado, you know, my mouth is a little dry. What if I just be with that dryness for a moment? Just kind of look at it. Instead of saying, oh, I know it's dry. I know I need a drink. What if I pause and just really look at 
what dryness feels like. That's a completely different experience than just grabbing a drink. Doesn't mean I won't take a drink because I will. But first, I explored the here and now of this. I explored how far back it goes. It goes back about this far on the inside. Goes out into the, out here to the inside of the cheeks. I was trying not to use a word, but it's hard to talk to people without words, but I uh hope -huh. it goes there. It's on the lips. And the funny thing is you call it dry, but it's not actually dry because there's saliva in there. Even that word's a lie. You know? If we explored all of life, that way, it would just be one wonder after another wonder after another wonder. Oh, wait, wait, what the hell did that Tao Te Ching say? The nameless is the origin of the universe. The named is the source of myriad things. Therefore, remain free of desire to behold wonder. That's what it said. Just quit wanting things to be what I want them to be. And suddenly they're wonder. You know, and, you know, we're just talking about a dry mouth here, just like NTI says, and that was only a chair, you know. Oh, my God, what do we do to our children sometimes or our spouses sometimes, you know, wanting them to be what we want them to be? <laughs> Oh my God, you know? And how much wonder do we sometimes lose wanting other people to be what we want them to be? You know, I'm sitting here in a place that's not air conditioned and so are, so is uh, Sean and George, we're all in the same place. And it's funny, I used to rent this place out, I don't anymore, but. It was funny the complaints I get about how hot it was. We needed air conditioning. <laughs> you know, is that true? What is hot? What am I actually feeling right now? You see, that was such a quick definition from the mind. It's hot. I want it to be cool, you know, but really, if I just look at this experience right now, forget even the word warm, hot, just what's being felt. I can't find anything to complain about. Somebody just drove out with a, a loud motor. In fact, I've heard people complain about this particular young man and his loud motor. <laughs> you know? But what if I don't think that way about that? What if I just listen to the rumble, rumble? It has kind of a, a, a rumbling roar sound what if i just listen to the rumble rumble roar sound you know it's kind of a guttural sound oh now here comes a tractor you know what if i just don't know what everything is and i just be with it this is what we do in meditation you know at least some of us we just be with whatever arises and we just let it be what it is without asking it to be something else in other words, we remove our desires from it. I would say this is how we can fall in love with everything. I was telling Sean and George, there's a conference right now going on in Aspen, Colorado. It's the happiness conference. People are talking about how to be happy. 
when, you know, this is it right here. <laughs> this is, you know, if you just let everything be as it is and quit asking it to be what you want it to be, you're happy. That's all, that's all there is to it. Remain free of desire to behold wonder. The next line says, by the way, if you remain with desire, you will see separate things, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you stay with desire, I want that to be a tree. I want that to be a too loud of a motor. I want this to be too warm of a temperature. I want, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. You're going to keep seeing those separate things. And then the next sentence says, the two are the same emergence, but they're known by different names, right? It's really the same thing. It's just a matter of whether you're going to place your desires on it, which we could also call self-will. Are you going to place your desires on it? Or are you just going to let it be as it is, which is the same thing you are here now? Don't ask it to be anything else. Let's see. So that was number 283 in the seven steps to awakening. We still haven't looked at how Regina, how Regina contemplated this in 2012. So let me read it again and then we'll go to out of the stillness. It is in the nature of desire to prompt the mind to create a world for its fulfillment. So going back, got to get out of the Tao, go back to out of the stillness. Desire is the seed from which the world, its pleasures, its conflicts, and its suffering is made. One attached to desires may feel those desires are needed. Without them, there would be suffering. The truer statement is this. Suffering could not be if there were no desires. I'll read that again. Desire is the seed from which the world, its pleasures, its conflicts, and its suffering is made. One attached to desires may feel those desires are needed. Without them, there would be suffering. That's what we think, right? The truer statement is this. Suffering could not be if there were no desires. So let's test this. Um, if you can, if you're perfectly happy, that's great. You don't have to leave it. But if you can, think of something either current or recent that in some way was upsetting to you. In some way, could be in any way whatsoever. There was something other than pure happiness. Let's word it that way. And we'll call that suffering, but you know, it might not have been like, you know, like your tongue hanging out suffering it could have been very mild, something other than pure happiness. And when you look at that, can you find that you had a desire? If you can raise your hand, I want to see how many people could find a desire. Uh, that's, that's everybody. So we just tested it. We just now can you also see that if you had no desire, maybe you wouldn't have suffered? I said maybe. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I have pain sometimes. I'm touching my shoulder because I felt pain in my shoulder, my wrist today. One of the things I'm doing is cleaning windows. And um, I have an artificial wrist, which doesn't do every, it's pretty cool, but it doesn't do everything a real wrist does. It doesn't turn in every little angle that a real wrist does. But even just doing that, it hurt right there just because I did something that it doesn't like to do. And then my shoulder was um, partially dislocated. And then also, I think there's a torn rotator cuff. So it doesn't quite like to do just everything and and some of the angles i had to get out to to wash these windows <laughs> my uh my shoulder and my my wrist they yelled a little bit today but 
I cannot say that I lost any happiness. Why? Because I didn't think they shouldn't be talking to me. In fact, that's what I perceived they were doing. They were talking to me. If I thought my shoulder shouldn't hurt, my wrist shouldn't hurt, then I get to be unhappy. It's not the fact that they hurt that causes the unhappiness, which is what most people think. It's the fact that we don't want them to hurt. It's the desire. That's amazing. All they were doing was talking. And I even talked right back. You know, my shoulder was like, I don't think I can do that. And I'm like, yeah, you can. I'll slow down. You can do it. This is going to make you get better. <laughs> you know, we had a conversation with my shoulder. That's what I did. So yeah, you can. I'll do it slower. You know, I'd slow down, reached in that way a little slower. But, you know, that's how it's going to get better is if I do what it says I can't do. I know that. You, know, you got to look very subtly, maybe. But every single time you're suffering, and again, it could be a mild suffering. It doesn't have to be your tongue hanging out suffering. It's because you want something. And a, an easy way to say it is you want it to be different than it is. You're unhappy with pain because you think the pain shouldn't be here. That's the real problem. You're unhappy with the temperature because you think it should be cooler or warmer. You're unhappy with the wind because it should be lighter or there should be more of a breeze. Oh, shh. Why, Shauna, are you unhappy with the wind today? <laughs> are you? <laughs> it's been kind of breezy today. It's not uncommon for people to be unhappy with the wind in Colorado or Wyoming. But again, what, why are we really unhappy with the wind? Because we want it to be different, aren't we? I remember when we were looking for a retreat house here, there was one particular day when it was the first time that I was in La Vida and I experienced, I call it the wind that built the sun, the sand dunes. <laughs> Right. It was the first day that I was in La Vida and I experienced the wind that built the sun, sand dunes. Um, and I said something. I, I don't remember what I said, but I said something, you know, like, oh, my God, it's so windy or something. And the guy that was showing us the house happened to be a Buddhist. And he said, if you're going to live in La Vida, you got to make peace with the wind. And I knew he was right. You know, I knew it. I was like, yeah, you're right. That was my last time complaining about the wind. Got to make peace with the wind because guess what? Guess what? The wind has been here for millions or billions of years. <laughs> it precedes me. It has more right to complain about me than I do to complain about it. <laughs> I'm the intruder. <laughs> yeah. It built the sand dunes, which, by the way, I happen to love. So how can I love the sand dunes and hate the wind? I mean, we just don't make sense because we don't pause and look. Desire is the seed from which the world, its pleasures, its conflicts, and its suffering is made. Now, pleasure here. Uh I'm going to define pleasure different from happiness. You know, we got to pick words and, 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 you know, words suck, but you know, it's what we have to deal with. So pleasure is a uh, conditional happiness, right? Pleasure is when the wind is just right. The temperature is just right. The sky is just right. And my free time fits right in there. <laughs> like everything is just right. That's pleasure. So, so pleasure has a backlash because everything's not always just right, right? So desire is the seed from which the world, its pleasures, its conflicts, and its suffering is made. One attached to desires may feel those desires are needed. That's an important sentence. Like I think it's important 
for me to desire okay and i have to stretch for a moment because i don't I, I know i used to be this way but i'm really not anymore so now i gotta try and find something what's something that i think i have to desire well i'm building a house right now so let's say i think that i have to desire that they get my closet just right you know we're in the process of they have to get it just right and if they don't get it just the way i want it then you know i'm not going to be happy so it's it's really important that i have this desire and that i manage this desire and that i control everyone you know to complete things the way i desire it because if not then i'm going to have a house with a closet i hate for the rest of my life <laughs> it's not true you know if you look at that for a moment you know imagine that you're building a house and there's some concern that the closet's not going to be right and you're thinking i got to get this you know i got to talk to this designer i got to i got to get are you happy in that moment or do you feel pressure in that moment? You see, desires tell us they're making us happy, but even when they're occurring, they're actually making us unhappy. You know, if I was a single lady desiring a mate, you know, and I'm trying to find a mate and I'm, I'm not happy in that when I'm thinking about that, I'm not happy in that. I feel lacking. I feel not good enough. I feel like something is missing from my life. Those things aren't happiness. Those things are suffering. So desire tells us it's going to make me happy. Like I have to desire a man in order to be happy. When in the very moment that I'm desiring what I don't have, I'm actually unhappy. It's like a great big lie. When you're happy with what is right here, right now, you are happy. Just with whatever happens, however it is, that's happiness. So without desire, we're happy. With desire, we suffer. And people hate that so much. You know, I mean, there's nobody saying it right now. <laughs> oh, Lynn is saying, did you want the pain to go away? You know what, Lynn? I didn't even think about the pain going away. That thought didn't even cross my mind. Uh, what did cross my mind was exactly what I said. If, if we, if I slow down, you'll learn how to do this. That's what did cross my mind. Like if I slow down and do this a little more slowly, then you'll, you'll, you shoulder will stretch, right? That's what crossed my mind. Um, now I forgot what I was saying. Does anybody remember what I was saying? <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. Go ahead. You want to tell me what I was saying? I can't hear you, you're muted. Are you talking, Karen? <laughs> yeah, um, just you were talking more about in the very moment you're desiring something, you're not happy. Yeah. Desire is actually uh, making you unhappy versus. Yeah, I would say just watch that. Yeah, here's what I was gonna say. It's not happening right now, but nearly every time I teach this, somebody complains about this teaching. That's how attached we are to desire. That's how much we think we need desire to be happy. Almost every kind, because this isn't the first time I've taught this, right? Almost every time I teach this, somebody makes a comment. Oh no, you know, we, you know, you can't mean completely let go of desire, or you know, oh no, I, you know, we do need some of our desires, or you know, they just it's like the mind won't even accept this. But I promise you, I'm telling you the truth. I promise you, I'm telling you the truth. And what you have to do is you have to pay attention to really right now when I'm wanting this new car, you know, what am I really feeling? And that doesn't mean you won't ever get a new car. It doesn't mean a new partner may not come along. It doesn't mean these things won't happen because life goes on. I think that's what we think. We think if we never, de if we never desire a new car, we'll never get a new car. Guess what? You'll know when it's time to get a new car. You know, you'll just know, hey, it's time to get a new car. That's different than desire. That's acknowledgement. Yeah, Lynn, go ahead. So the situation came to mind of uh, what if I'm drowning and I'm struggling toward the light uh, to the, you know, break the surface? I mean, it gets a little more subtle in there. Is there a desire I want to live? The thoughts can come in or there's just the action? No, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think that I think there's two things that go on there. And I think that maybe we need to separate the two because you chose drowning and drowning is actually very extreme. I know because um, 
although I never drowned, I've had water in my lungs before. I certainly didn't drown, but I mean, I know how extreme drowning is. Um, when you are drowning, your body wants to expel that water. And if it can't expel that water because more water is coming in, that, that, that natural reaction, because water does not belong in your lungs, right? That natural reaction is going to be there. So I think that's a natural biological reaction. It's, it's doing what it needs to do. Um, but at the same time, one thing that I'm also very aware of is one of the things that we do have to let go of, and I think it's the toughest of all things to let go of, um, is we have to let go of the desire for self-preservation. Hmm. Uh, and, and I'm not referring to the natural bodily reaction of when you're drowning, because that said that just happens. And trust me, I know I've been there, right? That fortunately I wasn't underwater when I got water in my lungs. And so I was able to expel it, but I know I could not have stopped the body from trying to expel the water if I'd wanted to, right? There's just nothing you can do about that. Um, but this desire for self-preservation, this desire to want to keep me is what will stop us from walking through the the gateway to awakening. So, uh, and you know, and Adya Shanti talks about this in I think it's the his book about Jesus. In one of his books, he talks about this. I think it's that one. Um, but he talks about how you know that that desire for self preservation ultimately does have to be let go of. But it's very possible it is the final thing you will let go of just as you're stepping through that gateway. Right. Um, so but it's helpful to be aware of the fact that the desire for self-preservation is an obstacle and that when the time is right, when the opportunity is there, that I need to be willing to let go of that. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, Dr. David Hawkins talked about it as letting go of the desire for life itself. Right. So, again, we're talking about two things. One is the natural bodily reaction. The other is more of a mental attachment. Yeah, I see that. Right? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I would expect that if you're drowning, your body is going to try to get air. Because <laughs> that's, that's just natural. Although, yeah, you know, you, real quick, I'll just say that, oh. you know, I've had a couple of friends, one right now who's right on the edge in, in hospice. Yes. And I, I'm not sure about her, but my previous friend who was, was there, she just being with her and watching her in the last part she completely let go of uh, needing to be here or not be here yeah and that's what people call a peaceful passing yeah. and Sina has pointed out to me uh that we are four minutes after and she's absolutely correct five minutes now so we we went too far too long uh thank you everybody and i will not be here next week because it's the first week in july helen hamilton will be here i'll be back in two weeks bye